Washington Theological Consortium has been honoring ecumenists uh, for many, many years, and we're delighted to um, honor another one uh, this year. Um, we um, are grateful for all of you who are with us uh, from various parts of the nation and world, and ecumenism has certainly become a strong global um, effort uh, and started out that way and continues to grow in, in those ways. We uh, welcome um, all of you and we welcome um, uh, the sponsor of these lectures, uh, Jack Fiegel, who is also our board chair this year of the consortium. And um, I also want to welcome uh, Dr. John Borelli, who is special assistant to the president at Georgetown University and an ecumenist um, par excellence. Uh, there, there are few uh, people who carry the banner of ecumenism like uh, John and Jack, and each in their own way. So uh, John, uh, I invite you to come forward to, to introduce our award winner. Thank you, Larry. I think Jack would agree with me that if you live long enough, you become a great ecumenist, right? <laughs> if you just stay at it as long as we have. You know, the modern ecumenical movement has always had global dimensions. Though participants at various stages in its more than 125 year history have had diminished understandings of what it truly means to be global. In fact, our perceptions of what it means to be global may interfere with understanding with the diverse participants at the moment, whether at times within our own worldwide churches or at assemblies of distinct worldwide churches are saying and doing. We're always called to correct our own perspectives and to address the legacies of parochialism and colonialism and racism and other forms of narrowness, discrimination and exploitation. It is altogether fitting for us in the ecumenical movement and in interfaith movements and interreligious engagements to undertake this self-correction as we live out our faith traditions. Now, this evening's speaker and recipient of the 2024 Fiegel Ecumenism Award, Dr. Larry Miller, has been blessed with a career of opportunities for global engagement. He was General Secretary of Mennonite, Mennonite World Conference for 21 years, and after that, Secretary of the Global Christian Forum for seven years, a new wider body bringing in churches that were not part, participants, members of churches who were not part of the North Atlantic, like I like to call it, ecumenical movement. Uh, he was co-secretary of a number of dialogues, the Baptist World Alliance and Mennonite World Conference uh, Theological Conversations co-secretary of the International Dialogue between the Catholic Church and the Mennonite World Conference, co-secretary of the Lutheran World Federation and Mennonite World Conference International Study Commission, as well as co-secretary of the Catholic Church, Lutheran World Federation and Mennonite Conference Trilateral Conversation, and a member of a body of uh, secretaries of world communions that meet from time to time. The very personalized introduction to Dr. Miller that you have in your program mentions his beginnings within his Mennonite community and only awakening, as many of us ecumenists have similarly had this experience in our communities, in young adulthood at a moment of activism for a better and more just society. So at some point, he had a conversion as we have, and began to serve his community in ecumenical initiatives and has experienced, as many of us have, the reluctance of members of our communities to meet with and appreciate the gifts of members of other communities. We have all experienced a, a kind of ecumenical embarrassment, haven't we, from time to time? As we push ahead, as we learn more and more from our conversations, if you look at the publications with Dr. Miller's name on it, for example, that trilateral uh, conversation of Lutherans, Catholics, and Mennonites produced baptism, a, 
a study of baptism and incorporation in the body of Christ. Uh, the Baptists and Mennonites in dialogue filed a report of their conversations. The one with the Vatican, with the Catholic International Catholic Mennonite Dialogue, has the wonderful title of Called Together to Be Peacemakers. And I knew someone who participated in that regularly, who's joined the clouds of witnesses that you gain as longer you're in the ecumenical movement. But he was just so excited about the exchange that they had on peacemaking and peace initiatives. Healing memories. So, so many of the dialogues that he, Dr. Miller's been part of have been with the churches that actually persecuted Mennonites during the Reformation. And so he's done a lot of work at the healing that takes needs to take place between all of these bodies. I won't go into all of these publications, but we are truly fortunate to have with us tonight a widely experienced ecumenist who has dedicated himself to widening the ecumenical circle and to opening opportunities for all to have a place in the discussion. His lecture is entitled, Can We See Christ in One Another and One Another in Christ? The Role of Experience on the Way of Visible Unity. And before we turn it over to Dr. Miller, I'm going to uh, ask Jack Fiegel to come down, who was introduced as our sponsor of this award and chair of the board for the Washington Theological Consortium. So, Dr. Miller, this is the award officially. Come on up. The Board of Trustees of the Washington Theological Consortium presents the 2024 Ecumenism Award to Dr. Larry Miller for his outstanding contributions to ecumenical dialogue and for building new relationships that deepen Christian unity, February 21st, 2024. It's quite stunning, almost shocking to wake up one morning in the middle of your solitude of retirement and find a message in your inbox from the center of the world, <laughs> of some kinds of world, from Washington, D.C., saying, you shall receive a reward, an award. <laughs> I wondered if they had the wrong Larry Miller in mind. We lived in France for many years, and in France, I was the only Larry Miller. Mm -hmm probably only one of two or three Larrys. But in the United States, there are dozens, there are hundreds, there may be thousands of Larry Millers. So I double checked, is this a, a scam? Is this some kind of a spam? Um, but it seemed to be a, an, honest, an honest email. So I went downstairs and told Eleanor, and she too had a hard time believing this. <laughs> but here we are. And somebody needs to be thanked. So I want to thank the consortium, Dr. Borelli. I'm not sure who all should be thanked, but I know that you're in that group of people that should be thanked. Mm -hmm. Dr. Goldman and Mr. Fiegel, Jack Fiegel. I had a revelation in the night since we left home in Atlanta a couple of nights ago that said, it's Jack Fiegel that should receive the award. <laughs> It's Jack Fiegel that should receive the award. I'm thinking of all my years working in the ecumenical movement. I don't know that I've met another layman. You are a layman, I think, who has done so much to promote the ecumenical movement. But unfortunately, I had this revelation after I left home, and so I couldn't bring the award with me. <laughs> um, but I will send it to you. The award that you will receive is a reproduction by Tese of the icon of Abbot St. Menas and Christ walking together. Do you already have one? No. no. You shall soon have one. Oh, thank you. This is a, an icon that was made in the 7th or 8th century in, in Egypt and is now found in the Louvre in Paris. But Tese produces them, reproduces them. And it is one of the favorite icons of Tese that you see in the Church of Reconciliation and that you see, if you could see in Brother Roger's uh, grave, you would see it with him as well uh, in, in Tese. It is indeed an honor and a joy to be with you this evening. 
But I confess that it would be more of a joy if I didn't have to give this lecture. <laughs> if I could just be here for the prayers, collect the award, enjoy the reception, and then go home. I have warm memories of the other time I was present for this event in 2013 to hear good friend Mel Robick give a lecture on creative imagination and ecumenism, and then to enjoy the reception afterwards. And when I look at the list of eminent Fiegel Award recipients and lectures that have preceded me, I wonder if the selection committee ran out of candidates and could find only some obscure church bureaucrat for this year's award. Maybe we are in some kind of ecumenical winter after all. But be that as may, it is a great privilege for me to find myself in, in your company this evening. I hope that it will be of some use to you in ways that I cannot yet imagine. Inspired by a Quaker practice, I would like to begin this evening with a query. Quaker meetings serve as, uh, use, use queries as a guide for reflection and a framework for uh, examining the individual lives and the life of the community. In light of the theme of this presentation, the query that I suggest you bear in mind this evening runs something like this. When has Christian unity become visible for you? When has Christian unity become visible for, for you? When have you seen Christ in another Christian? When has your church seen Christ in another church? What did the visible unity consist of? This is a rather long query. You can pick out the, <laughs> the one you like. What did the unity consist of? What made it visible? What made the unity visible? And perhaps, perhaps not least important, when, where, and how has unity become visible to you in this Washington Theological Consortium? I hope that we will hear from some of you after this presentation in the time we'll have for discussion uh, with one another. The Sixth World Conference on Faith and Order, scheduled to take place in Alexandria, Egypt in October 2025, will mark the 1700th 17th anniversary of the First Ecumenical Council, and will do so under the theme, Where Now for Visible Unity? Where Now for Visible Unity? It's a curious title. I'm not sure what it means, but whatever it means, it points to the fact that visible unity has been the primary goal of the ecum ecumenical movement from the beginning, and remains so today. From its inception 75 years ago, the World Council of Churches' primary constitutional function has been, quote, to call the churches to the goal of visible unity in one faith, in one Eucharistic fellowship expressed in uh, worship and in common life, and to advance towards unity in order that the world may believe. The constitution of the WCC's Faith and Order Commission is nearly identical leading some to say that the commission is the conscience of the council and of the ecumenical movement, keeping churches focused on the goal of visible unity. With its sixth world conference coming up in 2025, Faith and Order continues its historical role of calling the churches to work for visible unity. Or as the WCC press release announces, which announced the conference says, to reaffirm the goal of visible unity. Until recently, and in spite of occasional talk about ecumenical winters, mainstream ecumenists seemed confident that there was indeed a consensus in regard to visible unity as the goal of the ecumenical movement, and in regard to the definition of it, uh, which focused increasingly on communion ecclesiology. According to the Ninth Forum on Bilateral Dialogues organized by Faith and Order in 2008, and I'm quoting, both multilateral and bilateral dialogues understand the unity of the body of Christ as koinonia, the gift of the triune God, and believe that it is towards this ultimate goal that all ecumenical activity is directed. There is a growing consensus, a growing consensus that the koinonia is manifested in three interrelated ways unity in faith, unity in sacramental life, and unity in service. But who, in the context of a world Christianity, 
undergoing an historic transformation, a world Christianity increasingly disestablished, progressively Pentecostalized and moving southward, who actually shared in this consensus? Even when it, within the sec Conference of Secretaries of Christian World Communions, the group that officially convened the Forum on Bilateral Dialogues, there was no agreement. The Conference of Secretaries of Christian World Communions brings together in an annual meeting the General Secretaries of the Primary Global Christian Families of Faith. Its ecclesial scope is broader than the ecumenical movement in general, and then the World Council of Churches in particular. By the end of the 20th century, it included not only leadership of world communions engaged in the ecumenical movement, Anglican, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, but also growing representation from the so-called free churches, and especially importantly, from the younger global or globalizing streams of Christianity, evangelical, Pentecostal, independent, including African independent churches. In 2006, two years before the Forum on Dialogues reported a growing consensus in regard to visible unity, the Conference of Secretaries met in Rome under the theme Visions of Unity, not vision of unity, but visions of unity. In this broadly representative group of high-level world church leaders, there was a diversity of understandings of unity, of unity goals, and even of the words used to describe their visions of unity visible unity, spiritual unity, unity in communion, organic unity, unity in structure, unity in reconciled diversity, unity uh, in Eucharistic sharing, conciliary unity, unity in scripture and salvation, unity in mission, unity in service, unity in evangelism, unity in peace and justice, unity in discipleship, unity in prayer, unity of blood, referring to the fact that all the communions were experiencing somewhere in their world body persecution. Sometimes these visions seem convergent and complementary. Sometimes they were divergent and almost opposed to one another. Sometimes they were more spiritual than organizational. Sometimes more invisible than visible. For some, the, world, the word unity itself was problematic. They preferred the oneness language of Jesus' prayer in John 17. May they all be one so that the world may believe. And for some of those who preferred the oneness language, the really important part was the mission part. May they all believe. In a word, the ecumenical consensus on visible unity as the goal of Christian unity and its definition, as well as the dialogical, analytical, comparative methods used to work towards its achievement, included very little of the convictions, practices, and experiences of the newer expressions of Christianity, whose leaders were participating year after year in the Conference of Secretaries. In that context, and in many other contexts, it had become, it had become clear that there needed to be further reflection on what unity meant. If it was going to take into account the new majority Church of Christianity, which already by 1981 was in the Global South. Against this background, the formulation of the theme for the Sixth World Conference coming up in 2025, where now with visible unity, not only reaffirms the goal of visible unity, but also hints at some uncertainty about its future. The WCC held its 11th assembly in Germany in 2022 with the theme, Christ's love, moves the world to reconciliation and unity. The assembly's unity statement may provide a clue to the question about the future of visible unity. After remembering the unity statements of previous WCC assemblies and declaring that there is still a deep commitment to the goal of visible unity, the 2022 statement calls not for more dialogue or for more analysis, or for more documents, but for, for the first time in a WCC assembly, it calls for more love, more love. That sounds very ecumenical. It says, can we open our hearts? Can we open our hearts so that Christ's love may move us in ways that breathe new life into the search for visible communion? 
the work of unity needs to be inspired anew. And apparently it is only more love that can do that. With the language of love, we move into a world less doctrinally focused, more experientially, experientially oriented. And in the unity statement, we read also, there is a move amongst us to emphasize the experience of ecumenism more than the formal agreements. The church's responses, the church's responses reveal a longing for an ecumenism, ecumenism of in which we bring all of ourselves to the journey, all of ourselves, our hearts, as well as our heads. The church's responses referred to in here in the statement are responses of the churches to the 2013 Faith and Order Convergence text, the church towards a common vision. I'll refer to this henceforth as TCTCV, as seems to be the practice for those who are more head-oriented than heart-oriented. In a faith and order convened analysis of those responses, which came mostly from the global south, uh, the, pardon me, the global north, Maria Christensen says that this historic document does not say much explicitly about experience in the life of the church. The concept as such, she writes, seems to have fallen outside of the scope of the Convergence text, which is focused on ecclesial questions of a more theoretical nature. The responses to TCTCV, TCTCV show that several churches from different traditions perceive the ecclesiology of TCTCV as abstract and the text as lacking awareness experience in church life. Many churches call for more attention to experience. Faith and order, she's continuing to, to, to develop her statement. Faith and order should consider how, ex, how churches can be helped to experience unity and benefit from each other's concrete experiences. Faith and order should invite churches not only to agreed unity through the dialogues, but to experienced unity, not only to agreed unity, but to experience unity. Seldom in the quest for visible unity through ecumenical dialogue has convergence of experience been explicitly sought or received. And even less often, I suspect, has the role of experience in facilitating recognition of one church by another been considered. But more recently, however, and no doubt partly in response to the transformation of global Christianity, there seems to be a growing emphasis on seeking convergence of experience, on experienced unity, not only on agreed unity, but on experienced unity as a factor in mutual recognition, as an element enabling us to, to see Christ in one another and one another in Christ as a way to make unity visible. One can point to numerous uh, examples of this development in 2014, the WCC undertook its pilgrimage of peace and justice, not only as a, an instrument for promoting peace and justice, but also as a way for the churches to experience unity, to make it visible even before doctrinal unity was reached. Or Pope Francis, Pope Francis refers often to the ecumenical endeavor as a undertaking a pilgrimage together, as walking together. In his homily in 2015 at the Second Vespers on the conversion of St. Paul, he put it this way, to understand one another and to grow in charity and truth, we need to pause, to accept, to listen to one another. In this way already, we begin to experience unity, says Pope Francis. Unity happens when we walk together. Or one can look at the evolution of the of the joint working group of the Catholic Church and the WCC. It illustrates the same development. During the period 2007 to 2012, this joint working group focused on reception of the doctrine dominated dialogues. But during the next period, 2014 to 2022, when Avellino was in Rome <laughs> at the Pontifical Council, uh, they changed the, the attention to experience, shared experience on matters of justice, peace, and the care of creation, entitling their report, 
walking, praying, and working together, an ecumenical pilgrimage. Their report says, we understand that being together on the way in prayer and practice is a necessary condition for moving closer to the goal of visible unity. Churches together receiving and accompanying migrants, refugees, or churches working together for peace are not just provisional measures for an interim, the time toward the final goal, rather seeking specific ways of cooperation on vital concerns contributes to increasing mutual understanding and shared vision of faith. There have been other examples that one could lift up. I'll mention a few briefly. The fifth report of the Catholic Protestant Dialogue completed in 2007 includes a major part on experience in Christian life. And the entire 2001 to 2011 World Alliance of Reformed Churches and Pentecostal uh, Dialogue took place around the role of experience. Experience in Christian life and faith, worship, discipleship, discernment, community, and justice. We could also note the role of experience in the theological dialogues themselves. When the delegations meet seeking theological convergence, seeking agreed unity, their encounters are often nourished and energized by experienced unity, by sharing spiritual practices, faith stories, and visits to each other communities, by friendships with one another, this experience unity is often crucial to the excess of the dialogues and sometimes also to their subsequent um, reception in the churches. And I just want to do a, a, take a, a, a moment here to welcome Avelino, who was the, a co-secretary for the Pontifical Council, the Catholic Church, in the trilateral dialogue of Lutherans, Mennonites, and Catholics. Um, and I can, whenever I look at Avelino, uh, I do see Christ <laughs> in Avelino. Spiritual ecumenism, relational ecumenism, movements like the Focalare, communities like Teze, to name but two, all point to the role of experienced unity in making unity visible between Christians and sometimes between churches. The practice of receptive ecumenism may be of particular import importance in this regard. As Paul Murray, the founder of receptive ecumenism, had said already in 2008, receptive ecu ecumenism is not, and I'm quoting, it is not a purely cognitive process. It is a matter of the heart, which consists, now listen to this, which consists of falling in love, falling in love with the, exper the experienced presence and the action of God in the people, practices, and even structures of another tradition. With whom have we fallen in love lately? With whom have we fallen in love lately? Have we fallen in love with people, practices, and even structures of each other's churches? But let's return for a moment to the work of the Faith and Order Commission. Since publication of TCTCV and the responses to the commission to it, the commission has sought a much a broader participation uh, to paint a fuller picture of the visions, practices, uh, and unity in today's world Christianity. And they recently published a new two-volume uh, effort called "Towards a Global Vision of the Church." Explorations on Global Christianity and Ecclesiology. The first volume appeared in 2022, and it is filled with voices that did not participate in or respond to the TCTCV process. African, Asian, Latin American churches, Pentecostal, charismatic, African independent churches, mega churches, persecuted churches, migrant churches, basic ecclesial communities. A scan of the volume re reveals many references to the role of experience in the life of the churches. Most of them seem to value experienced unity more than agreed unity. Not a few seem skeptical, maybe even uninterested in, un in agreed, uh, agreed unity, as it has been defined in the ecumenical search for visible unity. And volume two has just appeared a few months ago. Its, ch its chapters are dominated by the conversation between 
mainstream churches and the younger churches. The third section of the second volume identifies uh, common themes from the global conversations. And one of these common themes now emerging is experience in church and theology, where we find this remarkable statement, which we might understand as a confession. It says, there can be no question that the experience of God, there can be no question that the experience of God plays an important role in the life of the believers and the church. It is all the more astonishing, therefore, that we hardly find it reflected ecclesiologically. Hardly find it reflected ecclesiologically. Without any pretension of reflecting ecclesiologically, I would like to offer for your consideration two examples from my personal experience of lived unity or experienced unity, and to ask in an extremely preliminary way whether this experienced unity led to greater theological unity or agreed unity, and whether it facilitated reception on the part of the churches involved um, of each other. And as I do this, I invite you uh, to consider your own experience. Consider your own experience. Listen to the voice in your head or your heart, remembering where and how you have experienced unity? Where and how have you experienced unity? And whether this experience related in some way to agreed unity? I'll be eager to hear from you um, after my lecture as an appetizer to the reception. The first example is about unity experienced in the Global Christian Forum which stands intentionally outside any process of theological dialogue aimed at formulating agreed unity or doctrinal unity. And the second example concerns the unity experienced by Lutheran and Mennonites in a process of reconciliation five centuries after the conflict that divided the two churches during the Reformation, an experience of unity that came about through and in the middle of theological dialogue. So for the first example, unity experienced in mutual witness, the practice of the Global Christian Forum. The work undertaken by Faith and Order following the publication of TCTCV is not the first time that the World Council of Churches has taken an initiative, initiative to broaden the table of ecclesial conversations to include the new majority Christianity where lived unity is often a higher priority than doctrinal unity. At the end of the 20th century, there was a deep desire to overcome the distance between the churches involved in the ecumenical movement and those passively outside it or sometimes actively opposed to it. The call for a new global process of Christianity was made in 1998 at the WCC's Eighth Assembly in Zimbabwe. Noting that the global Christian family uh, had now extended far beyond its own membership, the WCC's membership, the General Secretary, Reverend Dr. Conrad Reiser, envisioned the creation of a forum, a forum that would allow for more inclusive kinds of relationships. And in the years that followed, many conversations led to the creation of the Global Christian Forum. The Global Christian Forum aims to bring together around the same table leadership of the whole spectrum of contemporary world Christianity with at least half of the participants, 50% at least, representing churches that did not participate in the ecumenical movement and sometimes were opposed to it. And one of the main characteristics of the forum stems from this orientation. The emphasis is on lived unity, on experienced unity rather than on agreed unity. The forum does not see itself as an instrument of doctrinal unity where churches seek theological convergence through analytical dialogues and the production of doctrinal documents. The forum always insists that it does not publish any declaration other than the narrative reports of its own meetings. The forum sees itself as an instrument of relational unity. Its aim is to enable relationships between churches through relationships between church leaders. 
In this respect, one of the most important practices of the forum is that, that of all participants sharing their pilgrimage of faith or their journey with Jesus Christ. This practice is so characteristic of the Global Christian Forum that some have called it the forum's charism, its gift. It enables, enables full participation by Christian communities in which bearing witness or giving one's testimony is a central practice, in particular Pentecostals, Charismatics, Evangelicals, independent churches. That is precisely those churches that have typically remained outside and sometimes opposed to the ecumenical movement. If bearing witness to one's journey with Jesus Christ occupies such an important place in the forum, it is because, because it is often through this narrative practice of telling faith, faith stories rather than through any analytical method of dialogue that the participants are led to recognize one another in Christ and Christ in one another, as the forum puts it, and from whence comes the title of this presentation. Another source of unity experienced within the forum are the prayers, sometimes liturgical, sometimes spontaneous, that each stream of world Christianity leads in turn according to its own practice. Daniel Oko, president of the Organization of African Instituted Churches, described his most powerful experience of unity at the first global gathering of the forum in 2011 in Nairobi in this way. Hearing the sound of African drums and standing at the pulpit among leaders from a cross section of Christian traditions, I came to the conclusion that things had changed for good and forever, a miracle had happened. All our differences disappeared. For Daniel, when differences become invisible, unity becomes visible. Four years before the WCC's assembly uh, in 2022, under a love theme, the Global Christian Forum's third global gathering took place in Bogota in 2018, under the title, Let Mutual Love Continue. Let mutual love continue. The Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, now the Dicastery for Promoting Christian Unity, organized prayers on the final morning. And the council, the Pontifical Council, gave leaders of the International Catholic Charismatic Renewal Services five minutes to lead spontaneous prayers. Charismatic languages and melodies filled the assembly and did so for exactly five minutes. A Pentecostal member of the World Evangelical Alliance from India was ecstatic. It was a moment of historic unity, he exclaimed to me afterwards. It was, a, it was the first time I've ever experienced charismatic prayer at a global ecumenical gathering. And one of the leaders of the Catholic Renewal Services testified, testified privately to having experienced in those same moments a new dimension of Catholic unity. It was the first time, he said, that the Pontifical Council has asked the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Services not only to be part of its delegation, but to lead part of the prayers. Not only within the space created by the forum, but also through it, participants seem to experience unexpected unity with each other. When the community of Tese asked the forum to facilitate invitations to, to evangelicals and Pentecostals for its 75th anniversary celebrations in 2015, we did not imagine that one of the fruits would be a special relationship between the French monastic community which emphasizes silence in prayers, mm -hmm. and the African instituted Church of Pentecost, which practices something quite different in its prayers. <laughs> but the unity they experience together in a space facilitated by the forum has led to a lasting relationship, which will continue when the forum meets again at a global gathering in Ghana in April. The representatives of Teze, the representatives of the Church of Pentecost will spend time together there and time together after that gathering. Does the unity experienced within and through the forum play a role in the development of agreed unity between its participants? 
the sort of theological unity sought in the dialogues, perhaps, but only indirectly. As I already mentioned, the forum is careful not to produce theological statements, but it does occasionally offer space at its gatherings for churches to report on the results of their dialogues. At the third gath gathering uh, in 2018, the leaders of the Pontifical Council, the Lutheran World Federation, the World Methodist Council, the Anglican Communion, and the World Communion of Reformed Churches witnessed together about how the joint declaration on the doctrine of the justification had deepened their unity and made it more visible. And they invited all the other communions and churches and organizations present to join with them in receiving the declaration. An indirect but significant role that the unity experience within the forum has played in the world of bilateral and multilateral dialogues concerns Pentecostals. For decades, some mainstream Pentecostal church leaders and Pentecostal academics participated in dialogues in their personal capacity. The value of being at these tables of dialogue and relationship was evident to most, but the question of how to solidify a more encompassing authorization from the Pentecostal community remained. They had been participating as individuals without any official Pentecostal backing. Other Christian communions were intensifying their call for a structure for a member-based global Pentecostal organization to step forward and to provide an authorized body to relate to regarding Christian, Christian unity because the Pentecostal movement was becoming one of the, the largest movements in the global Christian family. Finally, in 2019, the Pentecostal World Fellowship established a Christian Unity Commission with a mandate to facilitate authorized representation of the PWF in intercommunion dialogue, forums, and conversations. And explaining this development, David Wells, Vice President of the World Pentecostal Fellowship, uh, pointed to experiences of unity within the Global Christian Forum. He said it this way, this context, the forum, has proven to appeal to a wide range of Pentecostals with its style of being testimonial, relational, missional. And indeed, seven members of the original commission of the Pentecostal World Fellowship, Ecumenical Commission, were actively involved in some kinds of activities within the Global Christian Forum. And both the chair and vice chair of the Pentecostal World Fellowship are currently members of the forum steering committee, sitting alongside at the table with representatives from the Vatican, the World Council of Churches, the World Evangelical Alliance, and 24 other Christian world communions. And interestingly and significantly, the PWF chair, William Billy Wilson, is also president of Oral Roberts University and chair of Empower 21, a global Pentecostal movement whose goal is that every person on earth has an authentic encounter, an authentic experience with Jesus Christ through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit by Pentecost 2033. My second example, and I'm, I'm getting closer to the end, so the reception is coming closer. Unity experienced in a lit liturgy, a liturgy of reconciliation. The example of the Lutheran World Federation, the Mennonite World Conference. The Lutheran Mennonite International Study Commission established in 2005 to examine the theological differences between these two communions found its work hampered by the shadow of persecution inflicted on Anabaptist Mennonites in Lutheran regions at the time of the Reformation. On the one hand, these persecutions weighed heavily on the identity and collective memory of Mennonites. On the other hand, Lutherans had largely forgotten this page of their history. One of the aims of the Lutheran Mennonite dialogue was therefore to face and heal memories. V rigorous historical research enabled the Joint Commission to establish a common narrative, a common narrative of the 16th century. Usually before that, the Lutherans told it one way and the Mennonites told it another way. This was the first common narrative, which itself was a gesture of healing and appeasement. 
And just parenthetically, let me let me remind you that the 2018 Figo lecture, um, the healing of memory, trauma, and truth telling in Lutheran Mennonite dialogue. Uh, the two recipients of the war that year were the two historians, one Lutheran, one Mennonite, who were the key people in helping us to construct a common narrative uh, of that 16th century conflict. You can find it on the, on the website. On the basis of this common narrative, the first phase of Lutheran Mennonite dialogue culminated in a public liturgical service during the Eighth Assembly of the Lutheran Federation in Stuttgart in 2010. At a plenary, plenary session on Ecumenical Day, the LWF asked forgiveness from God and from our Mennonite brothers and sisters for the wrongs committed against them in the past and for their lingering effects to this day. After the declaration, after reading the declaration, President Hansen, president of the Lutheran World Federation, invited Lutheran delegates to show their approval by standing or kneeling in silence and prayer. He also invited the representatives of the other churches present for Ecumenical Day, Catholic, Orthodox, Anglican, Reformed, Evangelical, Pentecostal, Adventist, African instituted to join in standing or kneeling in prayer as a sign of solidarity with the Lutheran action and to show that this moment of reconciliation was a gesture for the whole church. The vote was unanimous. All of them were standing or kneeling in silence or prayer. During the vote, we Mennonites found ourselves alone at the tables. You can see it's still a, a moving moment for me 13 years later, 14 years later. We suddenly found ourselves alone at the table, surrounded by hundreds of Lutherans and other Christians standing or kneeling, praying prayers of confession, petitions for forgiveness. It was a very powerful moment, a moment when we felt a little lost and entirely unworthy to extend forgiveness to these sisters and brothers in whom we could see Christ. Then President Hansen asked the Mennonite World Conference delegation to come to the front to respond. We had prepared for this public act through our own practices of discernment, knowing that we wanted to assure the Lutherans that forgiveness was extended to them. Acknowledging our own wrongs towards Lutherans, we, became, we were becoming more and more aware of our own prejudices against these people who had persecuted our people. Acknowledging our own wrongs against Lutherans. And deeply moved by this reconciliation experience, we presented them with a wooden tub used for foot washing a traditional worship practice in some Mennonite and Amish communities, declaring, we give you this tub with deepest gratitude on this day of repentance and forgiveness. From this day forth, let us serve one another as our Lord and teacher has served us. Following the, present, the plenary session, all participants moved together in a joint pilgrimage from the meeting hall to a sanctuary space for worship where the decisions that had just been made, had agreed unity had just been made, we, we received that liturgically in a service of Lutheran and Mennonite music, testimony, prayer, and mutual anointing. Most Lutherans and Mennonites will never read the reports of the Dialogue Commission. But the images and stories of the Stuttgart act of reconciliation, of the unity experienced there, have been widely received and reenacted locally around the world by Lutheran and Mennonite communities. In the sometimes violent society of Colombia, Lutheran and Mennonite churches celebrated together this powerful example of peaceful conflict resolution, even though the historic wrongs were far removed from their world. 
in one of the world's largest refugee camps in Africa, where the LWF was responsible to ensure civil government and security through nonviolent means, the collaboration of the Mennonite Central Committee, which followed the Act of Reconciliation, was warmly welcomed. And in one of the most highly visited museums of Anabaptist Mennonite history, which had always emphasized the persecution of Anabaptists and Mennonites by the other Christians, including Lutherans, those in charge of that museum added a new conclusion to their multimedia presentation entitled Reconciling in Christ, based in part on the Stuttgart event. In personal correspondence, Martin Junge, LWF General Secretary elect at the time of the assembly, described the importance of the experienced unity this way. I'm quoting Martin. For us Lutherans, the fact that we were able liturgically to enact reconciliation in Stuttgart was a huge game changer. It became worship and fe featured in worship. We took it out of a book. We took it out of a document. It helped give the signatures we set our, under our reconciliation process concrete traction where it mattered most, where it mattered most. That is where people gather to be nurtured by God. Martin continues, the Lutheran Mennonite action provided us with an important paradigm as we approach the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, where we apply the lessons we learned with you, the Mennonites, namely truth-telling and liturgically embracing reconciliation as a gift. The ninth report of a joint working group of the WCC and the Catholic Church, published in 2013 under the title Reception, a key to ecumenical progress refers to the Lutheran Mennonite reconciliation event in this way. This is the WCC Catholic yeah. joint statement. If ecumenical reception is to receive one another as Christ has received us, precisely the hope conveyed in the act of foot washing, the reception of Lutheran and Mennonite dialogue in visible acts of repentance and reconciliation takes on iconic, an iconic role that invites others to do the same, an iconic role, which invites others to do the same. And that is precisely what happened in at least one very important instance. Cardinal Casper, president of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, participated in, in the Lutheran, Mennonite, and ecumenical experience of unity in Stuttgart. After the liturgical service, the Cardinal said, to the LWF leaders, we Catholics and Lutherans must do something like this. We must do something like this together for the commemoration of 2017. And according to Martin Junge, this is why the Catholic Lutheran initiative from conflict to communion was developed, even though it meant temporarily interrupting the Catholic, Catholic Lutheran dialogue on baptism. You were in the office at the time, Avelino, you can verify or contest this story. The initiative resulted in the publication in 2013 of a joint study document, which paved the way for a joint Catholic commemoration of the Reformation event at the Lund Cathedral in the presence of the highest level representatives of other Christian world communions, followed by a public event for thousands of people in the Malmo arena, presided by Pope Francis and LWF leadership. In other words, the ecumenical unity experienced in the Lutheran Mennonite reconciliation event in Stuttgart was the starting point for a much larger ecumenical experience of unity on the Lutheran Catholic way of visible unity. And according to the 2022 Lutheran Catholic report, Baptism and Growth in Communion, the unity experienced in Lund and Malmo was a decisive and encouraging step on the way to fuller communion of Lutherans and Catholics. In conclusion, if there is indeed a growing emphasis on experience, where is it leading us? What impact will it have on established forms of ecumenism? Will dialogues and their reception in the churches be marginalized, strengthened, 
or reshaped in more experiential and narrative ways? Will we, will we be paying more attention to experienced unity than to agreed unity? Will all of this result someday in a new TCTCV 2.0? <laughs> where the ecclesiology of the younger churches, especially Pentecostal and evangelical, will play a larger, a larger role? Will we still be searching for a common vision of the church? Will we still be on the way of visible unity? Or will the unity be understood more in terms of spirituality than in terms of visibility? And to bring it closer to home, what role will all of this play in relationships within the Washington Theological Consortium. In any case, if experienced unity is the way favored by the increasingly influential families of contemporary world Christianity, we can expect it to play a growing role in movements for and in relation to Christian unity. Throughout Christian history, the church has struggled, the church has struggled to find the right relationship between wonder and explanation, between inner authority and outer authority, between experience and doctrine. But both experience and theology can be misleading. <laughs> Both can be misleading. May we not forget that we need both. With the perceptions of each one, testing the perceptions of the other. May we always remember that we need both. If we are to receive the unity prepared for us in the one holy Catholic and apostolic body of Christ.